Marcel Howe. In the late 1950s, when Corky Toys were launched, Dinky were already well established. So how daunting was it to take on such a major brand? And how difficult was it to break into that market? Well, it, I certainly never thought of it as daunting. After all, Dinky Toys were so basic with just a body shell, yes. a chassis, two axles and four wheels. And when we put in windows, uh, it gave the whole die-cast toy a new dimension. Yes. And also with that, and uh, the, we got a great advantage together with mechanical versions, mm -hmm. which had never happened before. Uh -huh. uh, yes, so that, uh, that was, it wasn't daunting. <laughs> never thought of it as daunting. <laughs> But it must have been quite a challenge to introduce so many new models every month. How did you manage that? Well, the introduction of two or three new models every month uh, did mean a lot of hard work, mm. mainly for my design staff, as not only they designed the, the model, they had to design all the detailed parts, make drawings of all the detailed parts, and they also then had to design all the tool, tooling and the moulds, the plastic moulds and die-cast moulds. So, they worked extremely hard and I can honestly say there was never any time lost in chatting. You never saw <laughs> groups of two or three having a two minute chat because mm -hmm. they just wouldn't, you know, and if I walked down the office now, saw two or three of them uh, chatting, which was very rare, I'd say, come on lads, back to it. Mm -hmm. And that was it. There was never any problem or argument. And they put in so many hours of overtime to as much as 30, 20 to 30 hours a week all the time. Good old fashioned work ethic. Oops, yeah. <clears throat> okay, the innovative features you introduced set the benchmark for toys back then. But is there anything that never quite made it into production that you wish had? Well, the one model that we completely designed and tooled and everything was ready to go into production but never saw the light of day was the road rover. Right. Now, that was to be launched at the same time as the Rover cars. Mm -hmm. And I, I'd been to the studios and I'd seen six of these models ready, you know, the proto basic prototypes, but it was never launched. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, only, the only concern really was that we'd lost all that design and development time, you know, when we, when we have such a tight schedule. To, to lose all that, that was the main problem. The, the model I would have relished to have worked on would have been the Coronation Coach, <coughs> um, which you've seen in, in my book, the lovely picture of the Coronation Coach. I would have, that would have been, you know, something to really get my teeth into. I'd have relished doing that. Some of your designs work closely with the car manufacturers of the day. Did this mean that also working secretly to hide designs until the final moment? No, I mean, I work very closely with numerous uh, car manufacturers and had very good rapport and a relationship with them. So much so that some of the major car manufacturers like Ford's and Austin's and that, I was privy to, and privy to what they were going to make two to three years ahead. Wow. I could go into their studios and see the clay models being prepared. So I got all that close rapport relationship and we never leaked a secret at all. None of my designers, uh, when they worked on these things, they would never talk about it. You know, mm -hmm. they would never, we never leaked anything. There is, um, I could have made a fortune in those days, couldn't yeah. I? Yeah. <laughs> <They leak. laughs> yeah, there is a wooden model that been. survives of the, the uh, PA crest that was released by Vauxhalls in 57 and it's got marked underneath 1956, so you already knew what that car was going to look yes. like before yeah. it came out. Yes. So how difficult was it within the business in the 60s to keep new ideas coming and stay in front of other manufacturers? Uh, well, we stayed ahead of the competition with constant new ideas. Uh, I, uh, I was never short of thinking up new gimmicks and that to introduce yes. it. Uh, my brain was working full time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I had a very good team to help design these models, you know. It's so alright coming up with the idea and doing a rough sketch, but then you've got to, work. you know, I can't get on the drawing board myself all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's certainly never any agreement between manufacturers. Right. No, never. Uh, uh, we, we never consciously, consciously thought 
of guarding our models and gimmicks. After all, our pipeline was about 12 to 15 months and we know our competitors took two years. Mm. So even if something was leaked to them that we were already working on, it would take them two years before they, their version was out, so we weren't, weren't really worried. <laughs> Excellent. Can I just ask you, Marcel, how complicated, how many people were involved in, in the James Bond Aston Martin? With all that mechanical well, uh, complexity. I don't know if you read my book, mm -hmm. I went to the studio, started a meeting with Cubby and his team, yeah. and uh, agreed then what gimmicks I would include. I mean, they were suggesting all sorts of things because the car went underwater. Mm -hmm. I said, no, we won't do that. But we'll get all the fins and things to flip out. And, and I actually, because of the sh time schedule, I mean, we'd got to get that model ready for when they started, when, when they released the film. Right. And I actually designed the mechanism on the back of my steering, on the steering wheel driving back up the M1. <laughs> so I got the whole, the whole mechanism worked out, ready to give to my right. designers and then, of course, you give it to the designer because I always see, I walk down the boards ten times a day, checking on everything. Sure. And if anybody got a problem, it's, uh, you know, the only t the only models I designed co myself completely were the all the classics. Right. Ah yes. Because the directors said, look, I know you're extremely busy, but we want you to design those yourself, and we'll keep keep your office locked and we, we won't let anybody in at all in the mornings, so I'd let just the mornings. But after a couple of weeks, even the directors wanted to come in and talk about something and as soon as they walked out, two or three people from the office would walk in and say, oh, while you're open, no, <laughs> we've got a problem. So it didn't work very well at all. <laughs> for the wicked. Are there any models made by others at that time that you wished you'd brought to the market, for example, uh, Thunderbirds, Lady Penelope's Fab One? Yes, well, I do wish we could have obtained the licence for uh, for Lady Penelope's Can and Thunderbirds, but uh, that was one of the very few models that I di didn't do the negotiating myself. Uh, nearly all the other models I did the negotiating with the manufacturers or whatever, the Formula One people or circus. And that was one of the few models. Our two main board directors went to negotiate it. Right. And the last they came back with nothing. And oh. I mean, I'm not saying any more. <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. so, so you did actually, you know, that, would have, that was actually on your list of... Oh, well, yes, because we'd made a prototype model of Lady Penelope's steering mechanism. I don't know if I think that was in the book. But uh, uh, looking back and looking on the bright side, if we had done that, then we'd have had to exclude other models which we wanted to do anyway. Yeah. Because we'd only got so a limited amount of resources. Yeah. Well, you got the Batmobile, didn't you? We got the Batmobile, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't negotiate that one. That was our director went to the States and came back with that. 